Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this incredible day. Lord, thank you so much for Ashley. Lord Jesus, we praise you for Jamaica. Father, we thank you that you are a God of all nations, of all the earth, the entire universe. And Holy Spirit, we pray that you would speak to us today. Be our teacher. May my words be your words, only your words. Father, bring conviction, encouragement, comfort, healing. Jesus, we love you. We praise you. And we are here before you to give you the glory. And it's in your precious name we pray. Amen and amen. You all may be seated. Thank you. And I love that. That's awesome. For those who are new here, welcome to the church at Woodbine and everyone else. Welcome. So good seeing you all here in person or online. We are glad you're here. A quick review. We are in the book of Acts. So if you've closed your Bibles or turned your phone off, go ahead and go back to Acts chapter 3. We're going to go. We're going to look at verse 11 through 26. But our sermon series is Neighbors and Nations. And last week, just a quick review, we looked at Pentecost, just a brief section of the entire chapter of chapter 2. And there were three things. Johnny taught you to say one. I'm going to teach you to say three. Three things. Say it. Three. The first one was this. God is faithful to fulfill his promises. That's what we saw last week. He promised that he would pour out on all flesh his spirit. And that's what Pentecost is. The second one is this. The gospel is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. First for the Jew, then for the Gentile. Then number three is this. Be continually filled with Holy Spirit. And if you're here last week, the example I used was, we love to go camping. But it is harder and harder for me to go because the ground is getting harder and harder the older I get. And so we bought a big air mattress. But it just slowly leaks until the end. And so my challenge for you and for me, and we're commanded, Holy Spirit never leaves us when we give our lives to Jesus. But we are jars of clay. And we're commanded in Ephesians to be regularly, continually filled with Holy Spirit. And we do that by abiding in Christ through prayer, worship, obedience, humility, It takes God to love God, and we so desperately need Holy Spirit to be preeminent in our lives every day. So that third thing was be continually filled with Holy Spirit. Today, the topic today is see and hear, and we're going to look at it really quickly. It won't be on your screen, but if you notice, actually we started in verse 11 after the first miracle post-resurrection by the apostles, at least the first one recorded. And backing up in verse 1, chapter 3, verse 1, and you'll have to look at it in your Bible on your phone. Verse 1 says, now Peter and John were going up to the temple for a time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. One of the things we have to remember is the early Christians, the first Christians, they were Jewish to the core. They lived a life of prayer, morning prayer, afternoon prayer, evening prayer. I love that rhythm. And here at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, Peter and John, who they've been filled with the Holy Spirit, the church has grown 25 times over. It went from 120 people to over 3,000 on the day of Pentecost. We don't know how long it was from chapter 2 to chapter 3, but one day they're going up for prayer. And we know as Christians we always need to pray. We need to pray. We need to pray. We need to pray. And sometimes it can be so hard. But we see the example of Peter and John. They're going into the temple to pray. And as they go in, there's this beggar there who was born crippled. He can't walk. And he asked for John and Peter, give me something. And Peter and John look at him, and Peter tells him, I'll let you can read this, Mary. There's homework, verse 1 through 10. Peter tells this crippled beggar, look at us. There's power when you look at someone in the eye. Now, I know there are some cultures we don't do that. But look at us. Peter is acknowledging this crippled beggar with dignity. And the beggar looks at him. And he says, I don't have any gold or silver to give you. But what I do have, I give you. Get up. 
He took the man by the hand. It says that his legs grew strong and he jumped up and he was healed. And it says these next couple verses, this man clung and he hung on to Peter and John as they go into the temple. Now the temple complex is huge. It's several football fields big, the whole complex. And this man hits leaping and he's jumping and he's praising God. He is creating a commotion. And I wonder if Peter and John are like, whoops, we didn't mean to do that. Or maybe they were leaping and jumping with this man. One of my questions is this. This man was born crippled. Why didn't Jesus heal him? Jesus had healed thousands of people. Yet he didn't heal this man. You see, Jesus healed everyone that came to him for healing, but he didn't heal every sick person in Israel. Peter and John, through the power and presence of Jesus, he heals this man and they go into the temple and it is a commotion. And it says in verse 10 and 11, verse, and we'll see it in verse 11 and 12, that the people began to flock and run to where Peter and John and this, crippled, this former crippled were. You see, today's topic is seeing, to see and hear. See and hear. You see, these people, they saw a miracle. And God used that miracle, that sign, to open their hearts to hear the gospel. There's two phrases. One is this, and I've said it numerous times. People need to see the gospel before they can hear the gospel. There's another phrase. It was coined by Jim Rayburn, the founder of Young Life, which is an amazing ministry it targeted to reach unchristian, unchurched high school and middle school kids with the gospel of Jesus. And Jim Rayburn said, kids don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Well, you know, that's true for people. People don't care how much we know about the Bible until they know how much we care. I got a story to share with you. And I, I've always gone back to my Mexico stories. It was 20 years of my life. Every once in a while, we would have to drive from our little town, which was about 10 hours away from the border, up to McAllen, Texas. We love Texas trips because in Texas, whoo, everything, everything was there. Walmart, Costco, Sam's, the movie theater, Chili's, McDonald's, Burger King, Starbucks. Because in our little town, there was none of that. And when I moved to Mexico, I never thought I would miss McDonald's. I didn't. And when you're 20 years old, 22 years old, you can eat anything and you won't see it. And so every Texas trip, which was like two times a year, I would fast. I wouldn't eat a thing the whole way up. We would cross the bridge, which usually took an hour to two hours just to get through immigration. And the first stop, guess where we go? Are y'all listening? McDonald's. Couldn't wait to get there. And there was this mission place we'd stay at. It was a cul-de-sac with like six houses. And most of those houses were owned by this older couple that were farmers in Colorado. And they felt called to move to McAllen Mission, Texas, technically, and to have this missionary renewal center where missionaries could stay for like 10 bucks a night to retreat and do all their paperwork, rest. And back in the 90s and early 2000s, before the cartels took over Mexico, there would be thousands and thousands of short-term mission trips that would go all throughout Mexico on short-term trips. And so every Texas trip, we would go up to Melody Lane, which was the name of this place, and we always would meet very interesting people. Some were amazing. Some were like, whoo, man, I, can't, I don't know how they got on the mission field. And we always would meet these, small, these big, small groups that would be going over, over to Mexico to serve in a gazillion different ways. One trip... And sorry, this is a long story. I apologize. But one trip, there was a group of about 30 college kids. And man, they loved Jesus. It was obvious. They were on fire for Jesus. They loved Jesus. I can't remember what Bible school they were part of. It was somewhere in Ohio, I think, or Nebraska. And they were going into Mexico to do mime and street dramas on the street. And talking with them, man, they so longed to see people saved. And I remember one day coming, coming back from running errands, and they're out in the front yard practicing their dramas. And I remember standing there watching, and it was awesome. I thought, man, that's impressive. That's amazing. Okay, awesome. And they were going to work with some churches in Monterey and Saltillo and a couple other big cities. So I thought, sweet. 
And the morning that they were getting up to leave, they were all packing up and they were dressed. And I wish I had a picture of it, I don't. Red knickerbockers, white shirt, red suspenders, and a red beret hat. Ooh, Theron took his green beret hat off. I told him I was going to share the story today, not to call him out. And I was like, I was looking at this like, what y'all wearing? And they're like, this is our drama outfit. And I asked the leader, and y'all going to go into immigration wearing that? And he's like, yeah, we're going into enemy territory, and they, they got to know. And I thought, hmm, 30 college kids dressed like military fatigue from France with red berets, white shirts, red suspenders, and red pants. Woo, you definitely are going to be seen. And my question was, will they be heard? I have no idea how the trip went. I pray that it was awesome. Because I'll tell you this, them dressed up like that on the street doing street drama, they will definitely draw a crowd. Just don't know how wise it was to go into immigration that way, to get their visas to go in. Seen and heard. Peter and John, going back to our text, they were just going to the temple to pray. Now, one of our goals, our number one goal as a church is to be a church of prayer. Prayer, prayer, prayer. Bathing ourselves in prayer. We started Lent last Wednesday. Fasting and prayer. We pray because it's intimacy. Johnny told us one thing, and you know what? There's only one thing required, and that's an intimate, loving relationship with our Heavenly Father through Jesus. Martha and Mary, Martha was all worked up because Jesus was in her home with the disciples and she was all worked up fulfilling her duty as a good Jewish woman to prepare the food. And yet her sister Mary was sitting at Jesus' feet and she was all upset with Jesus. Tell my sister to get in here to help me do the work. And Jesus says, Martha, Martha, you're so worked up about so many things. Mary has chosen what is best. To sit at Jesus' feet. Now, that doesn't mean we don't ever serve. We are called to serve. But it flows out of a love relationship with our Heavenly Father, which has that fan, that flame has to be fanned through prayer and through worship and intimacy. So John and Peter are going into the temple to pray as good Jewish men, but totally believing in the Messiah who has already come. And God opens this door for this amazing miracle they heal this man in Jesus' name. And then right here in verse 11, and let's stand again real quickly. In verse 11, right here, it says, while he was holding on to Peter and John, that's the former beggar and cripple. While he's holding on to them, remember, he's been leaping and jumping all over the place, praising God and causing a scene. All the people utterly astonished, say astonished. Good, astonished, ran toward them what is called the Solomon's Colonnade. That's part of the temple complex. When Peter saw this, he addressed the people, fellow Israelites, why are you amazed at this? I mean, why are you amazed at this? I mean, come on, a beggar from birth, we know who he is, can now run around, walk and jump, and he's praising God, and you're amazed? I mean, think about the irony. And then Peter goes on, why do you stare at us as though we made him walk by our own power or godliness. I, man, Peter, remember just a few months ago, he denied Jesus before a teenage girl. And this is his second big, huge sermon. And look at who, who is he pointing to? He's like, why do you look at us as if we heal this person by our godliness or by our power, or by our righteousness? And then what does Peter say? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our ancestors. Remember, Peter is talking to Jewish people. He's being culturally, oh, I can't even think of the word now. I can't even think of the word, but you know what I'm saying. Appropriate. Woo, gosh, brain freeze. He's being culturally appropriate, starting with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our ancestors. What does he say? He's going to throw a rock at him right here. Be careful. Has glorified his servant Jesus. He's not going to throw a real rock, okay? But Peter is going to hit them hard. The God of our ancestors has glorified his servant Jesus, whom you handed over and denied before Pilate. That's the rock. Though he, Pilate, had decided to release him, you denied the holy and righteous one 
and asked him to have a murderer released to you. You have killed the source of life whom God raised from the dead. You all may be seated. There is so much in this passage. There's so much to unpack. But look at what Peter's saying. Look at the names that Peter is giving to God. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our ancestors, the source of life, his servant Jesus, the holy and righteous one. The, the holy one is a name of God in the Old Testament, especially in the book of Isaiah. It's also a name, a title given to the Messiah. And like we saw last week, Peter is hitting it so hard that Jesus is the Messiah. And he says, and you guys denied him, you turned him over and you killed him. And then he says, by faith in his name, his name has made this man strong, whom you see and know. So the faith that comes through Jesus has given him this perfect health in front of you all. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man is healed. One of my questions is this, whose faith? It comes from Jesus. This man wasn't expecting to get healed. Was it Peter's faith? John's faith? Did God honor that faith? See, Hebrews eleven six 6 says, it is impossible for by faith. Can you guys go to Hebrews 11, 1, please? Sorry. Hebrews 11, 1 talks about faith. Now, faith is the reality of what is hoped for and proof of what is not seen. Verse 6 says, it's impossible to please God without faith. In Mark chapter 6, 5 and 6, Jesus, this is before he died, but he was already doing signs and wonders and miracles and healing tons of people. He goes back home to Nazareth and they reject him. And it says right here in Mark, he was not able to do a miracle there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. Ooh, think of that. Has our church even gotten to Nazareth where just a few sick people get healed? I'll take that. And yet it says that he was amazed at their unbelief. Jesus was amazed at the unbelief of those in Nazareth. God and in his incredible economy has chosen to work through the faith or lack thereof of his people. Now it's not the only reason why God heals or doesn't heal. There are numerous reasons. If you want to know more and talk more, invite me out for coffee. I'll pay for it. We'll talk about it. So I'm not talking about the name it, claim it, prosperity gospel type faith. That's garbage. Lies from the pit of hell. But I am talking about that Jesus-centered faith that Peter and John had here. In the name of Jesus, faith in Jesus that comes through Jesus made this man well. And then Peter continues. And now, brothers and sisters, I know that you acted in ignorance. You see, Peter gave him a big whopper. I am. You denied the Holy One and Righteous One. You denied the source of life. You killed him. And you asked Pilate to give us a murderer. You're guilty of Jesus' death. But he says, but I know it was out of ignorance. Compassion. Mercy, you see, it's by God's mercy, it's by God's kindness that lead people to repentance. It's not by God, God's hard judgments. It's his kindness that lead us to repentance. And Peter's being very compassionate to the people here. He's speaking bold truth. But he also is like, but I know you acted in ignorance. You didn't know. And then he continues, he goes on, he preaches the gospel you know, God fulfilled this and he predicted it through all the prophets that the Messiah would suffer. And then like we saw last week, he says, therefore repent. Repent so that your sins may be wiped out, that seasons of refreshing would come. Seasons of refreshing. There is so much in this passage. And Peter goes on to say, 
that, you know, Jesus has ascended up. He is the Messiah. He's exalted, and one day he'll return. And as Peter finishes here in verse 24 and 25, I'm going to read this quickly. In addition, all the prophets have spoken from Samuel and those after him have foretold these days. You are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant that God made with your ancestors, saying to Abraham, and all the families of the earth will be blessed through your offspring. You see, Abraham is the father of Jews. And God told Abraham when he called Abraham out, and when he promised that his wife Sarah would have a son in their old age, he said, and through your offspring, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Well, that's one of the prophecies about the Messiah, about Jesus. They'll all be blessed through him. And that's what God is doing right now. There are still 2.5 billion people that have never heard the name of Jesus. They so desperately need to hear the name of Jesus. Katie and Brandon are some of our global workers. That is why we send people after people to go to the mission field because there's still countries with no gospel presence. While at the same time, there are tens of thousands of people in this city that don't know Jesus. And it's our mandate that God has given us to share the love of Jesus with everyone around us. God is the God for the nations. Peter ends in verse 26, God raised up his servant and sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your evil ways. Peter talks about repent, turn back, and your sins will be wiped away. We talked about this last week, but I'll say it again. If you have not repented of your sins and put your faith in Jesus, why? He loves you. He longs to forgive you, to, for, to give you new life. So if you've not put your faith in Jesus, the Bible is very clear. You're already condemned. You're lost. You're one of God's enemies. And you're actually dead. And Jesus is calling you to himself to repent, to change your mind, to turn and come back to him. Peter also talks about times of refreshing. And I see this a lot for a lot of us as Christians. We sin and we walk in our sin, especially habitual sins. And the devil loves to beat us up. He loves to destroy us with guilt. He calls us to repent too. He calls us not to get saved again, but to throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And scripture is very clear. 1 John 1, 9 says that if we confess our sins, God who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. All unrighteousness. We've talked a lot about freedom prayer. In freedom prayer, we have a team here that does freedom prayer. And it's a prayer ministry that walks alongside brothers and sisters and it gives us more tools and it helps us to walk in greater freedom that Christ offers. If you want to know more about freedom prayer, you can talk to me. You can talk to Dustin Denning, who's right there. Wave your hand, Dustin. He and his wife, Carolyn, are the freedom prayer team leaders. We cannot do this on our own. James chapter 5, and I'll close with this because we're going to move into communion. James chapter 5, verse 16 says, Confess your sins one to another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. There is power and freedom in confession of sin. A lot of what was happening at Asbury was confession of sin. It is unbelievable when brothers and sisters, and you don't have to do it publicly from a microphone, you can grab a dear brother or a dear sister, and I encourage you, men with men, women with women, confess your sins one to another, pray for each other, and you'll be healed. Jesus brings healing and freedom but it requires boldness and humility to take the mask off, to say, this is who I am. And when we do, 
Jesus pours his freedom into our hearts and minds. I want to invite the worship team to come up. I kind of changed the way I was going on this sermon. But we'll just stop right there. Jesus longs to bring his freedom to this lost, dark, dying world. My prayer for all of us is that when people see us, they would see the love and mercy and compassion of Jesus. Thousands of people came to know Jesus through that miracle. They first saw Jesus heal a cripple, and then they heard the gospel. May we see Jesus working in and around us because he is. May we hear his life-giving words. And then together with that, my prayer for all of us who know Jesus, when people see us, may they see Jesus living in and through us so that they would be able to hear the gospel message.